Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. This is another one of my core concept videos which is designed to help students and lifelong learners understand how to apply, how to make sense out of utilitarian moral theory. So we're thinking mainly in terms of Bentham's quantitative utilitarian theory, um, not necessarily Mill's qualitative utilitarian moral theory, although that, that could be applied to these things as well. <clears throat> and the, the types of examples and applications that I want to talk about in this one all center around um, issues of health. And you can look at these in terms of individual, largely individual things. You know, if you're looking at it from a utilitarian perspective, of course, you're not just interested in how it affects um, the one single lone individual by themselves. You want to see how it affects other people. And then we got to think about larger, broader societal issues uh, as well. So I'm not talking in this about uh, a lot of what we call end of life issues or anything like that. But I am actually looking at a few other, other things here in this. Um, so let's start out by thinking about taking care of oneself. Um, does that matter from a, a moral perspective? Is that, is that an issue? Well, from a, from a rights-based perspective, which is the way a lot of people tend to look at these sort of things, um, you know, whether you take care of yourself, what it is you put into your body, what you do with, with your body, your time, all that sort of stuff is, you know, it's up to you. And as, as Americans especially, we tend to be, you know, very standoffish. Don't tell me what to do. You know, this is where, you know, this, this is where my rights begin and, and my um, sphere of privacy even for certain issues begins. A utilitarian wouldn't really look at it that way. So from a utilitarian perspective, the way that you would look at it is how is it going to affect, first of all, your own pains and pleasure, not just for the short term, but for the long term. What kind of life is it going to lead to? A life of happiness, a life of uh, misery, or somewhere in between? Are you, are you preventing yourself from actually enjoying some happiness? But then, you know, no man is an island, as they say, and very few of us are even peninsula. Um, how does it affect everybody else around you? That's an important issue as well. And if we're looking at it just on the individual scale, you're probably thinking about how does it affect uh, your family? That's a really big one. But you'd also want to think about how does it affect your coworkers? Um, how does health and the decisions that you make in terms of it affect um, people more broadly in your society, you know. For instance, if you go on disability, and you go on disability through something that was no fault of your own, then you can't really talk about, you know, having made a decision about that. It, it is a, a drain on, on society's resources. Um, and that's, you know, that's a big issue. Um, from a utilitarian perspective, any sort of drain like that is, is going to be a problem. Uh, you have to come up with some sort of, you know, if you're going to ex expend public funds on something, you have to be able to show, Bentham would say, um, and he actually does say this in a lot of places, if you're going to if you're going to tax people to take things away from them, essentially by force, by the threat of force, which they interpret as, as a pain, you had better be producing some, some higher pleasures that outweigh those pains as, as a result. So... If you go on disability because of your, your lifestyle, because you deliberately chose to ignore information about health and to pursue pleasure in a you know, much more selfish, um, self-indulgent, privately oriented, 
don't tell me what to do kind of way, well, you know, from a utilitarian perspective, you would actually be doing something wrong. So let, let's think about the, the, the things that we talk about the most these days when it comes to this. So taking care of oneself. Um, what does that involve? Diet is a big thing, you know. Here in the United States, we have a lot of uh, choices when it comes to, to foodstuffs. And um, a lot of people don't realize how much choice we actually have because they, they don't look into it or they don't want to invest the time and work that's, that's needed in order to make some of the choices become live, active choices. And I think I'll talk about some of those issues in a, in a separate video. I'm going to kind of skim over that. If you're eating junk food every single day, or even if you're eating healthy food but you're eating too much of it, well, then you can, you know, you can become obese, right? Um, that's a problem from a, from a health perspective. And we're, we're in this nation now where so many people have made bad food choices over and over and over again. And, you know, you can say, well, they don't know any better, or um, it's too easy to, to acquire cheap, you know, uh, empty calories or something like that. And there's some truth to that. That's something we can talk about, you know, a little bit later on. But when it comes down to the individual, if you know that something is unhealthy for you to partake in, and yet you're doing it all the time, you become responsible for that. And how, so again, from a utilitarian perspective, what's the problem with that? If there weren't any bad side effects, a utilitarian would say, hey, eat as much as you want, eat as much crap as you want, um, sugar, fat, you know, just stuff yourself full because we enjoy that sort of thing, right? So from a utilitarian perspective, pleasures are good. What's the problem then? Well, you know, there's attendant pains that come with it. I mean, you can eat too much, and, and we've experienced this sometimes at, you know, Thanksgiving. Eat too much, and then you feel kind of, kind of uh, lethargic, and your stomach hurts, and some people actually, like, undo their belts and things like that. Um, that's, you know... That, that's not happening all that often. But, you know, if you eat too much over time, um, your body doesn't feel good. You start feeling st certain pains. It starts to take a toll on your organs. It starts taking a toll on your, your joints. Um, I know this in part from, from my own perspective, so I'm overweight, right? I, I should be about 50 pounds lighter than, than what I currently am. Um, so, you know, you might say, well, who are you to tell me about this? Well, you know, I actually know from experience. There are pains that, that come with, you know, having too much, too much on your frame. Um, what else? You know, a diet could also include um, what you're drinking, you know. If you're drinking too much, you know, that takes an immense toll on your body. Because, you know, it's a poison. That's why we like it, because alcohol has these neat side effects. And then we've also, you know, found ways to make it taste really great uh, in a whole bunch of different ways. But if you're indulging too much in it, that has important side effects, just from a health perspective alone, that, you know, would, would have a bearing not only on you, but on, on your family, you know, whether you're able to participate in activities, um, whether you're able to, to, you know, provide as you ought to, um, how long you live. You know, I think most of us who like our family members would like them to live a long time, and if, if drinking or overeating or things like that are leading to people actually, you know, shortening their life, then from a utilitarian perspective, um, that, that's a bad outcome. If it's hurting other people in the process, that's a bad outcome. Um, you can also think in terms of example. You know, if you are, you know, in today's environment, kids are getting a lot of bad messages about food. If you want them to have good messages about food, you've got to serve them good food. You have to serve them decent portions, and this goes both ways too, by the way. You have to serve them portions that are the right size for their developing bodies. Healthy food, you know, it's okay to have, you know, ice cream and candy and stuff like that every once in a while, but not every single day, no soda at every single meal. You know, those are sugary drinks. That's, that's just, you know, sort of common sense, and from a utilitarian perspective, it makes good sense. And if you want your kids to actually follow through that, that yourself, you have to eat that way in front of them because it doesn't do any good to present them, uh, you know, you enjoying yourself while they have to sort of live a life of austerity. On the other hand, this is a big issue for girls, uh, especially, I think. Um, 
some parents go to the other extreme and they starve their kids because they get so obsessed with weight. You know, the, this is a, a big problem. I've seen this for, um, you know, particularly for women, but I could see men doing this as well. Um, you know, I think about wrestlers, for example, and the, their constant struggle to, to remain at a certain, certain weight class. Um, but it, but it's, a, it's a real live problem for girls, you know. Um, parents saying, no, you can't eat that much because we don't want you to get fat. When there's no risk of the, the child actually getting fat because they're, they're exercising, they're, they're doing all sorts of stuff. And then, you know, you know how you can tell a kid like that? You put them down at the table and you give them as, as much food as they want and they act like they're ravenous. So, that, you know, that would be a problem. Exercise. You know, we all know exercise is important. Um, again, I'm, I'm not a great example with this in part because I spend so much time doing sedentary occupations, reading, writing, generating course content, you know, shooting videos like this. This is not a very high, high uh, activity sort of, uh, you know, process here. I'm not moving around an awful lot. Um, exercise is important. If we're not getting enough exercise, just from an individual perspective, Again, you could say, hey, it's my right, I can do what I want with my own body. From a utilitarian perspective, you know, the response would be, well, no, not if it's actually affecting other people. If you're so out of shape that, you know, it requires all sorts of uh, accommodations to be made for you that cost other people pleasures or cause other people inconveniences and pains, then you're actually doing something bad from a utilitarian perspective by not engaging in exercise. You know, I think, for example, when I go to uh, Sam's or Walmart or, you know, Kmart or these other stores where they have these, uh, these um, motorized carts, you know, that you can sit in and steer it around. And I see some of the people that are in them, you know, and somebody's, somebody might be, you know, have an oxygen mask. And that, okay, that makes sense. They're not supposed to be just walking around. They're probably, you know, not doing too well, right? But I see people who look pretty healthy getting in these things with no sign of shame whatsoever. I mean, I'd be ashamed to actually ride one of those things so long as I'm actually able-bodied. Um, I'd have to get pretty sick or pretty hurt before I would get myself on one of those, in part because I think I do look at it in a fairly utilitarian way. Man, if I do that, I'm using up resources that, that should be used for something else. Um, what am I doing that I think I'm so important that I don't even have to walk around? Um, probably actually would do us all a lot of good to walk around more, wouldn't it? A medication, you know? Again, a lot of people don't like the medications that they have to take, and understandable, because some of them have side effects. I'm thinking in particular of, um, you know, medications that are, that are prescribed for um, psychological disorders. Um, people go off their meds, and that's a choice that they make. Um, and once you do that, there are certain things that are that are likely to happen, and those can be measured out from a utilitarian perspective, in terms of the pleasures that they're causing one, or the pains that one is avoiding, but also in terms of the pains that it is causing other people, or the pleasures that they are being deprived of as as a result. Um, you know, I'll just take a just sort of silly, trivial example. If um, taking your meds while you're in the apartment next to me keeps you from waking up at 2 o'clock in the morning and thinking that it's a great idea to turn your stereo on full blast, then um, you probably ought to take your meds. Because when you do that, now you're you know, engaging in some pleasure for you, you're really irritating me and probably everybody else around you in, in the complex. And if taking your meds would keep you from doing that, that's a gain from a utilitarian perspective. You know, when it comes to other meds, um, you know, if a doctor prescribes you something, and you can get it fairly cheaply, and, and for a lot of things you can get it fairly cheaply if you look at it in a you know, sort of broad perspective, um, if it's going to keep you from having more problems later on, then you probably should do it. 
preventative medicine. You know, what about uh, things like stretching, you know, doing yoga, massage, you know, breathing exercises, all those sorts of things. Well, again, from utilitarian perspective, for the individual person, they probably ought to be doing those sorts of things, uh, in part because they're, it's going to make them feel better, but in part it's going to lead to more pleasures and less pains for the people around them, you know. If I have a bad temper and doing relaxation exercises each day helps me not to be a jerk to my coworkers, then, uh, you know, Bentham would say you should be doing those, those exercises even if you find them hokey and irritating yourself for a while because you're, you're, you're making a better environment for people overall. Remember, utilitarianism, maximizing pleasure, minimizing pain for the general community. So I think that's enough about taking care of oneself. Now let's think about you know ways people don't take care of themselves, like in, in, you know engaging in risky behavior from a health perspective. So you know what would this include? Well, um, I had a friend uh, who, who used to do backyard wrestling, and they would do some crazy stuff. I mean. You know, the moves that people do in, in you know, wrestling, which we know are, you know, kind of kind of fake, they, they actually require quite a lot of athleticism to do anyway, though. Um, these guys sometimes would do these things for real, and they would do other things like, you know, hit each other with, with light bulbs, you know, and get glass on each other, and, and they'd, you know, have barbed wire and stuff like that. And sometimes these guys get pretty messed up. Um, one time the cops actually came and... And, uh, you know, it gave them all, I think, a stern warning. I don't think anyone actually went to jail for that. But why did the cops come? Because you're not supposed to be doing that. You know, you're not supposed to be fighting without a license. Why? Because we want to regulate that to make sure that people aren't, aren't getting more hurt than, than we actually expect. Well, that would be an example of engaging in risky behavior. And, and, you know, if you're a single guy on your own who's got too much wild oats that he needs to sow, um and you want to get yourself into a fight club or something like that, I suppose, you know, from a utilitarian perspective, that would be less taxing, you know, less of a bad idea than somebody who's got a family that maybe he's providing for, or that this is taking time away from, or an injury will, will keep him from being able to uh, meet the needs of. Um, what else? You know, um... Engaging in, in risky sexual behavior, um, sleeping with anybody uh, under the sun without any sort of protection from a utilitarian perspective in today's setting, really, really bad idea, right? Because there's a lot of terrible diseases out there that are not too difficult to acquire. And um, once you've got them, now you actually become a public health problem yourself uh, from a utilitarian perspective. Um, drugs, you know, engaging in, in uh, certain kinds of drug use, well, most kinds of drug use, really, when you get down to it, um, are probably going to be a bad idea from a utilitarian perspective. Um, so, yeah, why, why is engaging in risky behavior a bad idea? It's probably going to provide you a lot of pleasure. That's why people engage in risky behavior. There's actually, you know, some people get a real charge out of doing something wild. Um, so that actually increases the pleasure, which, you know, if you're, if you're Bentham, you say, okay, now we've got a higher bar that we need to meet. But how many people does it affect? How many other people, the, how many other people's lives does it lower the amount of pleasure? That would be the question he would want to know. Uh, most of the types of risky behavior that we tend to say, hey, that's a bad idea, tend to be types where... However much pleasure the person is experiencing, it tends to be worse outcomes for everybody else across the board. And, um, you know, we'd have to say the balance of pleasures and pains goes against that. Uh, now, here's two other really interesting things to think about from a utilitarian perspective. Going into work sick or sending your kids to school sick. We all do this, I think. I know I've done this plenty, um, not so much with the kids, but with myself. Um, and in part it comes from, uh, on my part at least, it comes from this sense of, hey, you know, suck it up. 
you're you're not so sick that you can't go in and you know do a lecture or grade some papers or something like that. You know, I'm 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 in some sense a workaholic, which probably from a utilitarian perspective, you know, is not taking care of myself. Right? It's not balancing pleasures and pains rightly. Um, should I go into work if I'm, if I'm actually sick? If I'm likely to um, make other people sick as a result? Probably not. I should probably take a sick day. I, you know, a lot of this depends on the capacity to, to actually exercise sick time and stuff like that. I remember when I was back in, in the Army a long, long time ago, we, we had sick call, but you had to be really, really, really sick before they'd actually let you go on sick call. And they'd, they'd put it to you like this. They'd say, well, you can go on sick call, but uh, it's going to reflect badly on you if you're if you're not really really sick. You know we don't want people doing that sort of stuff, so we wouldn't go on sick call. So we had injuries that we you know just sort of took care of ourselves, and uh, you know in retrospect it was a really dumb idea. We have a healthcare system in part to try to keep people from engaging in this kind of behavior that that would make for a worse situation for. Uh, for other people. Should I require students to come to class even if they're sick? That's, you know, that's kind of a tough call too. Um, if you think about it, how much are they actually learning if most of their class is occupied with how bad they feel, wiping their nose, trying not to cough and bother the other students, and thinking about, oh, I just want to get back in bed. Probably not that much. I'm probably actually, by requiring them to be there, I'm probably actually causing them more pain. Um, so I should probably have a more flexible uh, attendance policy than I currently have. Sending your kids off when they're sick. A lot of people do this in part because, you know, this is where we can actually measure things in terms of dollars and cents. Um, if you're going to keep your kid home, you got to take a sick day usually. Or you've got to find somebody else to watch your kid. Um, or I suppose you could send them to, to daycare sick, but that's really the same, same thing as sending them to school sick. You know, this is where you've got to think about things in terms of how is it likely to affect other people. If you send a kid who you know is sick in with a bunch of other kids, and you know the way that kids behave, you know, they're not the cleanest animals on earth, um, they're going to get other kids sick. And that's, that's a negative utility, right? It's, it's causing a negative outcome for, for other people. These are, you know, fairly individual kind of things. Let's think more about big picture societal kind of things. A lot of debate about providing health care. Whether as a society we ought to be providing health care to everybody what level of health care we ought to be providing, uh, you know, what degree of choice we want involved in that. All of those are things that I think could be analyzed from a utilitarian perspective, but it would take a lot of work to actually do that. And most of the people involved in these sorts of debates tend to quote the studies that back up their side or their preferred plan or something like that. Let's say we back off from all the, the political machinations and buzzwords and things like that. And we think just in terms of providing basic health care universally. Is that a good idea or is that a bad idea? We, we, we put aside the worries about, oh, is that going to destroy the insurance market and who's going to pay for this and all that. Let's say we just analyze it in terms of, you know, of a, a kind of government-run uh, option and we say, okay, it's going to be paid for by taxes. And let's say we actually assume, and there's a big assumption, I understand that, that it would be fairly efficient, right? Would it be a good idea overall? So when we're thinking about things in a utilitarian perspective, we can think about current things, how they currently are, and what it would be like if we, if we did that. Would it lead to an increase in utility, a greater overall balance of pleasures over pains, if we in fact had universal across the board health care? Not Cadillac healthcare, you know, where everybody gets, you know, everything that they need, but a sort of minimum level across the board. And then I suppose if you wanted better stuff, you could you could spend your own money on that. I would I would guess that from a utilitarian perspective, the answer would be yes. That would in fact be better because the people who who tend to get pretty sick 
or who get caught in the system and unable to, you know, say, get insurance providers to actually pay for things, they're pretty unhappy. Um, and, you know, people aren't happy when you raise taxes, but they're not so much unhappy. And, and everybody can relate to the possibility that they're going to get sick or somebody else that they care about is going to get sick. That it makes some sense. I mean, you know, really, if we were going to do that sort of thing, it would have to be across the board. So we would do things also like get rid of Congress's uh, free health care stuff. All that, they'd go into the normal system like everybody else. And they would have to suck it up like everybody else. So they'd have to have a real incentive to make sure that it's a livable system, that there aren't a lot of, cor there's not a lot of corruption and waste and all that sort of thing going on. As a matter of fact, I think from a utilitarian perspective, you could actually make a really good argument that Congress people, all right, we can do this for two things. This is a digression, but Congress people get really good health care for life, and most of them don't send their kids to public schools when they're residing in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so here's what I would actually suggest from a utilitarian perspective. Small amount of people are being affected, but they have immense power. They and their families ought to be required to go to the crappiest hospitals in their, their areas and participate in the lowest level of health care available. They also ought to, their kids ought to be sent to the lowest performing schools in whatever district they're living in. And if they're, if they're spending a lot of time in Washington, they ought to have to go there. Uh, and, and everyone knows the Washington, Washington D.C. public schools are just a nightmare uh, for the most part. So I think that would actually lead to some, some pretty significant legislative change and, and oversight about these sorts of things and really change the conversation, not only for the Republicans, but also for the Democrats, who are total hypocrites when it comes to this kind of thing. Okay. Back to my, my uh, thing. So providing health care, uh, you know, a good thing overall. Yes, it extends life. Uh, it allows greater capacities for pleasures. It, it hopefully eliminates a lot of pains. It does cost in terms of pains for providing those sorts of provisions. And I think you probably have to build in something so that these, you know, can't just keep blossoming and blossoming the way that, that, that they are. Um, that leads to the second thing. What about rationing or, or triage? You know, you have finite resources available for dealing with sick people. And you can see this in emergency rooms. That's where, you know, triage is particularly important. That's why you might sit for a long time in some hospitals waiting to get treated because the guy who's got the gunshot wound to the head is going to go ahead of you because, you know, he's closer to dying than, than you are with your, your nail in your foot or, you know, whatever else happened, you know, the cut your thumb got a concussion or something along those lines. Does triage make sense from a utilitarian perspective? I, uh, yeah, I think it makes complete sense from a utilitarian perspective. What you're doing is you're identifying where the greatest payoff in terms of spending resources, which is a loss, are going to come, and then you're dealing with that. And then the other things you're sort of arranging in, in order of priority based on, you know, what your, your ratio of, of good outcome is to investment of resources. Um, rationing. When you have universal health care, you do have to have rationing. You can't provide everything to everybody. I mean, you have rationing one way or the other. Not everybody's getting everything. It's just a question of how do you actually apportion the rationing. Is it is some sort of rational, fair procedure? Or is it just sort of haphazard, whatever, you know, ends up falling out, you know, or is it done according to who knows who, you know, some sort of corrupt process? Does rationing make sense from a utilitarian perspective? I think, yeah, it does. Again, for the same reason that triage does. Um, there's diminishing, what we call diminishing or marginal utility for investing in certain kinds of things. So, you know, plastic surgery, for example, there are some legitimate needs for plastic surgery. Somebody is in a terrible accident, their face is disfigured. Great. Provide them with plastic surgery. Um, somebody wants to have a nose job because they get made fun of for having a big nose. Uh, I don't think that's quite as important. I don't see that as quite, uh, you know, the, the payoff 
in terms of pleasures and pains. Somebody wants to have plastic surgery so they can go to Hollywood and compete with the other people who have plastic surgery. No, that should be a completely elective procedure that they should have to pay a lot for, uh, and nobody else should be paying for it. That would be you know, an example of, of rationing. Let's move on. There's a couple other really interesting issues here to think about. Disclosure of health risks. We currently have this, this set of you know, procedures and laws that we put under this umbrella, HIPAA. It means that you can't really disclose much about somebody's medical records. To, to another person. But you can't even ask about a lot of things. Is that a good idea or is that a bad idea? Well, think about uh, some famous cases where somebody was sick. Typhoid Mary. I don't know if you know about her. She was a food worker who infected, she was a carrier of, of uh, a you know, terrible disease and you can think about all sorts of cases like this where there's people who are carriers and um, she was, she was a, you know, a cook by, uh, by profession. Um, she kept on doing it. She knew she was carrying the illness, but she felt she needed to work. And they managed to sort of track her down and um, eventually they sort of took her out of circulation. But a lot of people got sick in the process. If somebody's carrying a deadly disease, should we reveal that to other people? Should the need to protect other people from getting sick and thereby experiencing pain, displeasure, um, you know, discomfort, unhappiness, misery even, sometimes horrific deaths, does that outweigh that person's right to something like privacy? or, you know, to, to not be um, looked at in a, in a certain way. Let's say, you know, there's a social stigma about a lot of diseases. Well, you know, from a utilitarian perspective, at least if we're looking at it in quantitative utilitarian terms, I think that there's a good argument for publicly disclosing at least certain kinds of diseases, maybe having alerts, you know, maybe for people who are engaging in risky behavior and have diseases as a result, you know, certain venereal diseases or, you know, kinds of hepatitis from drug use or things like that, maybe it wouldn't be a bad idea for other people to, to know about that. Um, again, you'd have to weigh, you know, like if the stigma is particularly high, that might actually be enough to say, well, no, the displeasure caused by that and, you know, the social disruption caused by that and the other dis displeasures following from that would outweigh the, the, the uh, other, you know, displeasures that would be caused by, by putting people at risk. Um, inoculations. A lot of people don't like inoculations because they're worried that, um, you know, there's connections to autism or to other, other risks. And, you know, really, if the... If the um, if they wanted to put that stuff to bed, they probably ought to do more studies and uh, the doctors that are on one side ought to not be quite so condescending to the doctors and the parents and people like that on the other side. I don't have a dog in that fight myself. Um, I'll tell you, my kids got, got inoculated. I don't have any problem with that. I don't have any problem with inoculations because I was in the military and I had to be inoculated against all sorts of things. Um, but I can understand the argument that um, you know we have to look at what the, 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 the risks are in inoculations. There are some risks. Some people do get affected badly by them. Um, what are the trade-offs? Think about you know something like uh, that was a big problem just several generations ago, polio. If you know anybody who's actually had polio, and I've known some people in my, my parents' generation, um, it's horrible. It, it really did a number. One that lasts the entire person's life. It's disfiguring. Um, it was eliminated almost entirely by using inoculations, by wiping the disease out. Um, from a utilitarian perspective, the amount of misery or unhappiness that's prevented by inoculations outweighs the even certain 
risks that some people are going to get sick from it. If the number over here is much, much greater of the total pleasure allowed or, you know, the misery that's prevented in comparison to the small amount that's coming from the people who do get sick, this outweighs that. Antibiotics. Another big issue these days, way too many people taking way too many antibiotics. We see what the effects are, um, antibiotic resistant bacteria, and um, that was a bad, you know, bad idea. It, it was a lot of individual decisions that led to a, a overall structural problem that now we have to, we have to find some way to deal with. Now we've got some antibiotic um, super bugs out there, and we're going to have to figure out how we're going to deal with that. And, you know, the answer isn't more antibiotics, because uh, they're antibiotic resistant. We're going to have to find some way to deal with that. Um, from a utilitarian perspective, you, you could have made an argument back then that antibiotics ought to be somewhat um, limited in their application and use. Nothing like the massive, you know, use them for everything kind of regime that we've had over the last 20 years. Um, it's too late now, unfortunately. So that's a retrospective. Last one, I'll talk about quarantines. Uh, again, that would be very similar to this disclosure of health risks or inoculation. When people get sick uh, and they've got some sort of, you know, highly contagious, um, high risk, high damage kind of disease, should they be quarantined? Now, think about it this way. If you quarantine people they are probably not going to be getting good health care. They are probably not going to have a very good quality of life. Imagine quarantines like the old days where they just put a cordon around the area and anybody who tries to get, get through, they shoot. You know, that's what, what used to happen in the old days. Or you get stuck on a ship somewhere and um, you're on your own. See who dies, who doesn't. Meanwhile, everybody on the outside is kept more or less safe. Is that okay to do from a utilitarian perspective? And the answer is yes. If you're preventing much greater harm from an outbreak that would take place in the general population by confining, say, to a city. You know, think about uh, Albert Camus' The Plague. They quarantine an entire city because bubonic plague breaks out. That's better than the whole world getting it or even the rest of the country getting it, isn't it? You're preventing a lot of harm by imposing some harm on some people. The question, though, is not whether you don't impose harm on anybody. It's whether you impose harm on this population here, which is much smaller, or whether you allow harm to occur to a much larger population. From a utilitarian perspective, that's a pretty easy one to address. The answer is yes, utilitarians would be for quarantines. So. Um, you see there's a lot of applications for utilitarianism to these sort of health issues, um, both individual and societal. I think it's a, a particularly useful way, uh, not the only way, of course. Again, I am not myself a utilitarian. I'm actually a virtue ethicist. Um, but I think it's a useful way for thinking our way through some of these, these uh, health issues that we are, are facing these days, uh, sometimes in our daily lives, sometimes in, in crises or in, in terms of politics and society.